Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. Today is our Earth Day Sunday, a week late since I was on vacation last week, but as an Earth Care congregation, we are, are still going to take some time this Sunday to, to think about God's creation. Um, our theme this year is pollinators, so we have our nice big butterfly here to remind us of uh, the importance of pollinators in the world around us. So as we gather in this time and in this space, we welcome those that might be joining us via live stream. And it is a communion Sunday, so if you're joining us at home, you have time to find uh, some bread in a cup. Uh, so when we get to the communion part of our service, you can join along with us as well. And so as we gather, it's May. Can you believe it? May 1st. Oh, happy May Day as well. And um, that starts a fresh month, which means we have a session meeting this Wednesday night. And uh, we have a new Bible study with a Thursday morning group. It's based on the Apostle Paul. And uh, if you don't know, Paul wrote many of the letters that are found in the New Testament. So if you're interested in learning more about him, you are welcome to join us on uh, Thursday mornings at 10, either in person or I can send you the Zoom link. We do have people that join us by Zoom as well. Are there other, oh, Sue said she put the coffee pot on. Um, there are refreshments, but if you wanna just have a cup of coffee after worship, you are welcome to go and socialize and fellowship over a cup of coffee. And Sue is going to host next week's fellowship time for Mother's Day. So I can't believe it's already Mother's Day next week. So I want, feels like it should be one more week, but we're early. First Sunday of May is May 1st. Uh, other announcements this morning? Kathy. I want to thank everyone who contributed to uh, the food supplies we needed for the faith kitchen last Saturday. Um, Michelle was there. <laughs> And um, Amy and Bob, myself and Adrian, we serve 50 um, clients of the Faith Kitchen. And uh, everyone contributed either the ingredients that we needed, and I just want to have a shout out for all of you that did that. Um, it's not too soon for the youth to think about our summit, summer mission adventure starts on June 26th through June 30th. And we will be helping Morris Habitat for Humanity with their house that they're constructing on um, Edith Road in Landing. So if you have any questions about it, see either me or Carrie, and we'll be happy to answer them. We hope we get as many um, young people. We also need adults who can participate and help with food and chaperoning, etc. Thank you. We had an extremely large donation of all-purpose cleaning wipes delivered to us on Easter Sunday. So if anyone has a use for, I'm going to donate some to like Table of Hope and Family Promise and um, Faith Kitchen, but we have even more. Um, so <laughs> if anyone would like to take one or two home for their own cleaning purposes, uh, they are available just right out here in the hallway. So I invite you to help yourself. Other announcements? Okay, let us take this time now to center ourselves with the music.
Please join me in the call to worship. Loving God, all of nature calls you blessed, and so do we. For you have woven an intimate tapestry and call it life and called it good. In love, you have formed a universe so diverse yet so related, and into its web you call us forth to walk the land and swim the sea with all our natural brothers and sisters. To the stars we see no more than blades of grass, yet to you, each of us, as each blade of grass, each star is an irreplaceable treasure, an essential companion on this journey of love. Loving God, as you lure the whole world into salvation, guide us with your spirit that we might not be only pilgrims on the earth, but pilgrims with the earth, journeying home to you. Open our hearts to understand the intimate relationship that you have with all creation. Only with this faith can we hope for tomorrow's children. Our opening hymn is 473, For the Beauty of the Earth. Please join me in the Earth Day Litany. You have created the universe by your eternal word and have blessed humankind in making us stewards of the earth. We pray for your world that we may share and conserve its resources and live in reverence for the creation and in harmony with one another. You have given the human race a rich land, a land of streams and springs, wheat and barley, vines and oil and honey. In Christ, you call us to a new way of life, loving our neighbors before ourselves. Help us to treat with care and respect the world as it is, as we live in hope and anticipation of the world as it will be, when your kingdom comes and your will is done. Thank you for those who have shown a true respect for your creation. Help us to follow in their footsteps.
hear these words that Paul writes in his letter to the Romans. He says, let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. And if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Friends, this is the good news. Let us take this time to share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And the peace of Christ be with those of you at home as well. Our next hymn is God of the Spirit. Psalm 104, verses 10 through 18. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills, giving drink to every wild animal. The wild asses quench their thirst. By the streams, the birds of the air have their habitation. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for the people to use, to bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has its home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the conies.
Our second reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, beginning with verse 4. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. For they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Several years ago, one of the churches in our presbytery, Ogden Memorial Presbyterian Church, which is in Chatham, spent a month focused on bees. They do what they call monthly mission. So every month they pick some sort of mission and they focus on that for the whole month. And so the Presbyterian Church USA has um, a presbytery mission giving catalogs. We're very familiar with Heifer International here, but it's the same idea, but it's through the Presbyterian Church. And so they decided to adopt the gift of beekeeping for that month. So the goal was to raise, in special offerings, $240 to support somewhere around the world a beekeeper and a hive of bees. So just... Um, instead of just asking the congregation to donate towards this goal, they created a month of fun worship ideas. And they used the scriptures of the Beatitudes, playing on the word Beatitude. Each week they would learn something new about how valuable bees are, such as pollinating crops or creating honey and creating income for many small farmers around the world. And then they concluded their month-long ministry and worship experience with a meal using honey in the various dishes. I love that idea. So although bees themselves are not mentioned very often in scriptures, honey is. They do talk about honey. So the bee must not be too far away. From the website earthday.org, I learned that there are 20,000 distinct bee, spe bee species around the world. And we have right here in the United States 4,000 different types of bees. I had no idea. Although out of those 4,000, honeybees are not native to the United States. They were brought here in the 17th century. 
One resource said that as Europeans were fleeing wars and poverty and land laws or religious persecution, they brought extensive beekeeping skills to the United States during the next two centuries. So that was new information that I learned as well. And then I found this as a fascinating fact. A single bee colony can pollinate 300 million flowers in a day. I don't know. What do you think about that? I don't know. <laughs> can you believe everything you read online? I don't know. That just seems amazing. But approximately 75% of the world's crops depend on pollinators. Without bees, many of the world's most important crops would fail and directly affect the food supply of humans. Now, since it's Communion Sunday, I was like, oh, this is perfect. I can tie it into the growing of the grapes and the grain and the bread. But guess what? <laughs> After doing a little more research, I learned that grapes are actually self-pollinators. So they don't need the bees or the butterflies. <laughs> and then I learned that grain is wind pollinated. So they don't need the bees or the butterflies either. Oh well. <laughs> so sometimes you want to go in one direction and then you go deeper and you learn oh, it's not going to work that way. So, um, so our communion does not need pollinators, but we do, right? We do. We need bees and butterflies and other pollinators such as hummingbirds and bats. Now what we are learning over time is that when we use certain pesticides, um, it's having a negative impact, right? It's having this negative impact on our pollinators. And we're also learning that our suburban landscaping, our nicely manicured yards, guilty here, and our beautiful flower beds, they're not conducive for many of the native pollinators in our area. So as we learn these things, some people have chosen to create pollinator gardens in and around their homes. We just had this conversation right before church started during Sunday school. John was talking about wanting to plant things that the bees would enjoy. Now we have uh, friends in Annapolis, and when we go to visit them, we walk around a lot. It's a beautiful little community, and um, people have these cute little houses and these little fenced-in yards, and more and more people over the few, uh, the, the, I can't remember how many years, 10 years or so that we have been visiting them, um, they have started to do what is called native yards. And so many of the people in the neighborhoods around the Annapolis area will actually have a sign in their yard that says it is a certified wildlife habitat. So no more green grass little yards, but these beautiful native yardscapes. It's really kind of refreshing to walk around and, and see how people design their, their yards and make them um, wildlife friendly. So again, from a website that I was looking over with uh, this information, it says, when we plant pollinator gardens, we encourage the positive interactions that happen in nature to occur, supporting a healthy, biodiverse ecosystem. Now, the news is telling us that worldwide, pollinator populations are shrinking. And there's several overlapping factors that contribute to this global trend. And that includes what we call habitat fragmentation. There might be a, a nice big park like we have at Horseshoe Lake. And then a bunch of um, roadways and um, buildings and you get the whole Route 10 and all of the um, uh, stores, the concrete. And then you might have another park down a ways, but those habitats are now fragmented. They, the birds or the animals can't naturally get from one park to the other, right? They've been fragmented by our, our, our buildings. There's also, of course, pesticide use, climate change, 
and also the spread of emergent pathogens, parasites, and predators. We're all very aware of this um, lantern fly, and we're not 100% sure how dangerous it could or could not be, but we're encouraged to, to uh, eradicate it <laughs> when we see it because it's not a native species, right? And so it could, in the long term, cause some damage. Um, so those are things that are impacting um, our, our pollinators, is that when other species get introduced that aren't supposed to be there, it can um, diminish the populations. So I've seen numerous reports that um, say we should be planting milkweed to help support the declining monarch population. And I know several of our church members have milkweed growing around their property. Uh, the Chester Presbyterian Church, they have a milkweed garden and the last time I was over at their church for a Presbytery event, it was just buzzing with activity. It was really cool to see it and to see the monarchs and to see um, just how actively alive it was. Um, so planting milkweed or creating a pollinator garden uh, can be something that is a simple step to take, right? It's not a large scale or costly endeavor. We can do simple things. Uh, planting native plants that are actually better suited for our local habitat and they require less care than exotic plants because they're supposed to be here. <coughs> so on this Earth Day Sunday, why is this important? Well, obviously, without pollinators, right, we will be facing a food shortage. Even though most of us are not in the farming, food growing industry, Right? We can still do simple things to support these valuable little critters. Jesus feeds others, right? He feeds people through the loaves and the fishes. And as in Matthew 25, we are called to live out the teaching that we should feed others. And feeding others is one of our core values as a congregation. So if we're going to faithfully live out that calling of feeding others, we need to be more aware of what it means to grow food rather than just thinking, oh, I can always just go to the grocery store and buy it. Because in our modern world, there is this severe disconnect, right? We're just so used to being able to go and do. I know there's a handful of you that do gardening here, which is wonderful. And even more that maybe have come from farming families. So we have it in our, in our DNA, in our, in our history, or in our families. But we are pretty disconnected, right? We don't get our hands enough in the soil. And we don't know um, so often the work it takes to germinate the seed or the amount of rain, right? I, I joke, I don't have a green thumb. <laughs> I have succulents in my office because I will kill anything that needs water. So I have the most easiest plants to take care of. Um, but people that are really connected into growing food, they know about the waiting and the worrying, the possible flooding or the droughts, and they know about the diseases that can just wreak havoc on a harvest. Now, some things we have absolutely no control over, such as a late freeze or too much rain, but we can. We can each do our own small part with protecting pollinators, of creating a healthy yardscape where these creatures can flourish. I was talking to the Sunday school kids this morning, and I'm like, we love butterflies, but those bees, they get a bad rap. Right? We'd much rather have a butterfly garden than have the bees around our house and our yard and our play areas. You know, we just, we just don't care for them so much. Um, but we need them. We truly do need them. So I want to transition to today's scripture passage because something is going on here. And it relates to a food source. Now we are in the post-Easter stories of Jesus encountering the disciples after his death. So it's been three years that these disciples have committed their lives to following Jesus. They gave up everything for three years. And then Jesus dies. Now, 
they should have already encountered him in, in the post-resurrection. But here we have them in the story today, where they've just they've gone home. They've left Jerusalem, they've gone back to Capernaum, and they're in a boat, and they're fishing. Because that's who they were when Jesus found them. He found them as fishermen. It's like they, they just took those three years and said, well, that's done and over, and let's just go back to where we were before. But there they are where they were before, except they're not able to do what they were doing before, right? They used to catch fish, and they're not catching anything. Their nets are empty. So what happens when the fish are no longer biting? When we were in Greece many, many years ago, I was shocked to learn that the fish had to be imported because they had overfished the Mediterranean. And if you wanted Mediterranean fish, it was exorbitant in the price. Right? So what happens? What happens when the fish are no longer biting? What happens when the crops are no longer growing? And what happens when food sources are depleted? And then there's something almost prophetic in this story. Because we have the stark contrast of not catching fish. To suddenly, these disciples, wondering who is this person, could it possibly be Jesus? And he says to them, throw your nets to the other side. Go to the right side of the boat. When suddenly they're catching more fish than the nets can even hold. And the only difference, right, the boat hasn't moved anywhere. They should be catching the same amount of fish on the other side. The only difference is they're acknowledging the presence of Jesus in their lives. For thousands of years, God has invited humanity to walk alongside of God. And we've been giving guidelines, instructing us how to live as God's holy people. And some have chosen to follow God's teachings, and others have gone and sought self-gain. And over and over again, our planet, it has been damaged by human self-interests that have pulled us away from living within the bounds of our local habitats. And the beautiful design of biodiversity of God's created worlds. And so I see this text as prophetic because the disciples have lost their purpose. They had this connection to Jesus. They had this connection to God. They had this purpose. They were disciples. They were no, not supposed to be fishermen anymore. Right? God had caught them, called them to go and teach others that there's more to faith, there's more than to religion than a set of laws and rituals. That they were to embrace that God was a God of compassion that cared for everyone. So they were supposed to go and feed and um, provide for and engage others. They weren't supposed to retreat home. And so when they leave their purpose, when they leave what God has called them to do, they catch nothing. And we as a society, not saying individually, but as a society, there are times that we lose our way. We lose our connection to how God has called us to live. Right? As a society, we use pesticides, we cut down forests, we cover the land with warehouses and stores, and we disrupt the natural habitat of so many animals. And we don't see the disconnect right away, right, in the story with the disciples fishing. As soon as they realize it's Jesus and he says, go to this side of the boat, there's this immediate abundance. And unfortunately in our lives, it takes 20 30, 40 years for us to say, oh, wow, that might have not been what we should have done, and we're feeling the impact now. It 
takes a lot longer. But the good news is, the good news is Jesus came to them. Jesus didn't say, well, I can't believe I spent three years with them and they just gave up. Right? Jesus goes to them. He comes to them even though they went home. And he goes to them even though they're catching nothing. And he continues to instruct them. He tells them to throw to the other side of the boat. They have to change their strategy. As easy it was, it was a very easy strategy to change, right? Just go to the other side of the boat. And we too, right? We too can change our strategies. Jesus still comes to us. He still meets us where we are, even if we're not catching any fish. But when we listen to God, when we listen to our Creator, when we throw to the other side, we just might start making simple little differences. And today I encourage that difference to be in the life of the pollinators, whether it's the butterflies or the bees or the hummingbirds or the bats. We can each make a simple little difference. Amen. This is one I took um, right in our church garden. Um, so the echinacea comes every year, and I believe that is a swallowtail. I was going to do a quiz, and then I realized I don't know my butterflies at all. So I know the monarch. <laughs> As we transition in this time to communion, our communion hymn is Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ, 514. the wrong book. I'm sorry. They all look the same. <laughs> Let us hear these words. Blessed are you, strong and faithful God, all your works, the height and the depth, the echo, the silent music of your praise. In the beginning, your word summoned light, night withdrew, and creation dawned. 
As ages passed, unseen waters gathered on the face of the earth, and life appeared. When the times at last had ripened, and the earth grown full in abundance, you created in your image man and woman the stewards of all creation. You gave us breath and speech that all the living might find a voice to sing your praise and to celebrate the creation you call good. O oh, holy God, how wonderful is the work of your hands. When sin had scarred the world, you entered into covenant to renew the whole creation. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, as a father joyfully welcomes his own, you embrace a people as your own and fill them with longing for a peace that will last and for a justice that will never fail. Through countless generations, your people hungered for the bread of freedom, and from them you raised Jesus, your Son, the living bread, in whom ancient hungers are satisfied. He healed the sick, though he himself would suffer. He offered life to sinners, though death would hunt him down. But with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms and surrendered his spirit. Gracious God, as we offer you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we remember your son, that death could not bind him, for you raised him up in the spirit of holiness and exalted him as Lord of creation. Let your Holy Spirit move in power over us and over these earthly gifts of bread and cup, that they may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ, and that we may become one in him. May his coming in glory find us ever watchful in prayer, strong in truth and love, and faithful in the breaking of the bread. Amen. Friends, this is not a Presbyterian table, but this is God's table. And all who seek to be fed and nurtured by our loving God are invited to participate in this feast. And so it is that Jesus, when he gathered with his disciples, he took the bread and he blessed it, giving thanks to God. And he broke it and he said, take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. And in the same manner, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today I'm going to invite you to come forward on this side. The bread is here and the cup is here. You can either take them back to your seat and just leave the cup in the um, little tray or the garbage can is over here. So I invite you to come forward. <laughs>
Let us pray. Loving God, you graciously feed us. You have received these holy mysteries with the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have received this sacrifice be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises tell of your glory and truth. We who have seen the greatness of your love see you face to face in the kingdom. For you have made us your people. By the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord, and by the life-giving power of your Spirit. Amen. And now as a people of God who have broken bread together, we take this time to share our joys and our concerns with one another. Um, we do have our ongoing prayer concern list. If you're not on the prayer chain and you'd like to be added, um, if you don't have Sandy's email, you can just contact me and I can pass that along. Um, she sends out emails maybe once or twice a week with various prayer concerns on them. Are there prayer concerns today that you'd like to lift up? John? My little rich uh, friend in Ohio, the sister in the hospital, and they died in the home of a heavy stranger. Okay. So prayers for your uncle. Prayers for my neighbor, Maureen, her brother passed away. Oh, okay. Prayers for Maureen, who has lost a loved one. Yes. Pray Henry. Henry? Prayers for Henry. Yes. The family of Diane Willis. Prayers for the family of Diane Willis. Okay. And I just ask that we pray for um, the clergy here in town. We have several clergy that are experiencing health issues. So just we'll pray for um, for the clergy. That would be great. Yes. Family of Jacob McLean. Okay. Yes. Prayers for you. Yes, thank you. Prayers for Ukraine. It's ongoing. Yes. Pray, pray, pray. Yes. The Bernadette. prayers for Bernadette and um, the various things that are keeping her now from continuing her, her chemo treatments. Absolutely. Your ongoing health. Yep. Other prayers? All right. Let us come before God this day. I know that um, Rebecca had asked during Sunday school, we're going to we'll pray for all of God's creation, but she loves bunnies. So uh, we'll add that to our, our prayers for all God's children and little critters. So I told her I would put it in the prayer part. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for the children of our church, for their sweetness and their um, openness and just their connection to um, the love of animals. They just are, are so sweet. Um, and so we just give you thanks for them. We pray for this greater world in which we live, the ongoing disaster of, um, of violence and war in the Ukraine, and for just all the children there, loving God. It is so heartbreaking and is so unfair, and we do just want to cry out and, um, and, and ask you to make it stop. Um, and so we do. We pray. We pray for the people. And we continue to lift up um, and support the, the first um, the agencies that go in and offer humanitarian relief. Um, and just our own denomination that is doing so much in our connections there to help people in this extremely, extremely difficult time. A loving God, we continue to pray for our own loved ones and the people of our congregation, for those that have experienced recent loss. 
For those that are still um, undergoing various forms of treatments and uh, the ins and outs that those treatments have on us, uh, loving God, we pray for those that are in recovery stages, that have had surgeries and are now gaining strength. We pray for those that are just not able to be with us on this day. Um, but they know that we are thinking of them and praying for them and um, spiritually with them. So, loving God, there's, there's much for us to pray for. And I guess that is why we are told to pray without ceasing. It is an ongoing concern as we um, journey this world together. And so, loving God, as we enter in the spring and um, we just seek to find some peace in the beauty of the world around us and the um, abilities to be outside more with the warmer weather and just to um, find ways for our own beings to relax and uh, just breathe in your, your presence and your peace. So just help us, just as you told those disciples to change their strategies. There are times in our lives too that uh, a little change can make a big difference. So as this group here today, let us unite our voices together and pray what Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is um, in the white binder, if you want to use the music. Um, I think it's the very first one. And it's one Ellen used not too long ago, as we had a worship committee meeting as a prayer. And I said, up. Oh, we're going to sing that soon. Um, in the bowl, there is a flower. So as I send you out into the world today, 
I send you out as God's people, people called to pay attention to the good creation around us, people called to pay attention to the ways that God calls us to feed one another. And so it is that we go out in our various ways. We go out to serve the Lord. And now may the grace and peace of God the Father Almighty, the reconciliation of the Son, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one, now and forever. Amen. Amen.